All right, guys, today's guest, you have likely seen his work on the big screen. He was Lee Schreiber's stunt double in Ray Donovan and most famously Gerard Butler's stunt double in the movie 300. He's also flexed his veteran stunt skills in the Matrix and John Wick franchises. And honestly, I would take half this podcast listing his credentials. So please welcome to my show today, Tim Connolly. Hey, how are you? Hi. How are you? Good. All the way from the UK. I know. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. I know it's in the evening there and you're probably prepping for tomorrow. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a big schedule over here. We even we got a full day of snow. So that was May that I ask was what you're filming. Uh it's a it's a it's a, a second season of a series called uh Gangs of London. Wow, okay. Yeah, yeah. amazing new action TV show on AMC and uh it's getting a lot of hype internationally, and so we came in to do the second season. And uh, not a children-friendly show. They, they, took, they took the action to different le uh, levels, so it's a uh, it's, it's going to be an interesting experience. Well, I don't expect any movie you do is a children-friendly uh, programming. So uh, you haven't seen my Jackie Chan films, then. <laughs> Which okay, let's start with what's were you you must in stunts in that. I guess yeah. Jackie Chan's not gory. Uh, no, no. I had a little couple, two Jackie Chan films. I think, and one had kind of a stunt acting role for it. Is it the was it the mask or tuxedo or something? Or tuxedo? I did tuxedo. I did tuxedo. <laughs> the reshoots we had here in LA. Yeah. And then uh oh boy, I'm gonna get in trouble if I don't remember this one, huh? Um, uh oh. Uh, uh it was not rush hour. No, 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 no. It was a one I word movie, I feel like. I was a Russian thug. <laughs> now, do you find that you play like the Russian thugs? Because I've seen your work and you're always like, obviously the bad guy, usually. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I think I started out in my career playing the bad guys. And then I kind of moved into what we call 1X. So the, the stunt double of the lead actors on the show. So then you do more of the hero stuff. And uh, and then slowly kind of moved out of that, started doing more of the stunt acting roles. And so back to thug world, like the Jackie Chan film, I think it was a uh, spy next door. So, you know, big uh, Russian thug, very children friendly movie. At least my niece and nephew love it. That's so fun. That's amazing because I know that your niece and nephew, they're Asian. Growing up Jackie Chan movies, I'm sure the parents had that on the TV when they were kids. So they're probably like, whoa, Uncle Tim's like fighting Jackie Chan or whatever. Yes. And, and you know, Jackie Chan movie. So it's spaghetti on the head and hit with the pots and the pans. And, you yeah. Know, so very like, Jackie Chan fun. He's like the, I guess, the Groucho Marx of Chinese stuff, kind of. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, came up in the the Chinese opera, and uh, I mean, he took action films to a whole different level, adding the comedy to it. So. Yeah, makes it more acceptable to beat people up. <laughs> well, enough about Jackie Chan. We're here to talk about you in more creative ways. <laughs> Back to you, Tim. So, okay, I brag about you often when people talk about The Matrix or John Wick. I'm like, oh, my friend was in that, and. So you're spoken of without even being present. And um, obviously you didn't just jump into stunts doing big films like that. You started off somewhere and tell us how it began. Like, I know, okay, I'm so excited. I'm talking about everything, but what was your first role? Like what was your first stunt job? Well, I guess, I guess my first role was, uh, it was when I was at the Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs, I, I did a new print aspirin commercial for the Olympics. And, uh, and, the, and so what, that was the first time I, you know, went through the casting process and, you know, they try to tie in the sponsorships and, and, uh, and so I got one of the roles in the big new print commercial that aired through all the Olympics. And, and so that was my first test taste test of, of the film industry. And that's from your Taekwondo background. Yes. Okay. And you're, did you do the Olympics? I was not in the actual Olympic games. I fought in everything there. I was the first alternate in the 88 Olympic games, but I was uh, the U S team member for five years. 
I fought in two Pan Am games. I fought in the World Championships, the World Cups. I was ranked number two in the world. So I did everything except for the Olympic Games. Oh, wow. That's amazing. And when did you get into Taekwondo? Were you a kid? Yeah, I, I early teens I started. I, 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 you know, I, I got jumped by a gang when I was in junior high. I, I think I was like in sixth grade, sixth or seventh grade. Is and in uh, yeah, in California, Northern California in San Jose. And uh, I got jumped by a gang of five kids. And uh, so wasn't a great experience, but the next week I was in Taekwondo classes. Okay. So I was at Taekwondo. I wasn't like boxing. Why would this like white dude want to do an Asian martial art? Uh, I think it was somebody that we knew at school or something that was already doing it. And then, oh, let's go try that place where, they, where they're at. So we, we went there and, and little did I know that that one choice changed everything in my life. That one little decision to go do martial arts that day changed everything in my life. My whole life path is revolved around that one choice. And then did you have a natural talent at it? Or did you work really hard and defy what you were born with or your natural instincts or reflexes? Yeah, interesting question. It's like, I, I think some people tell you I was gifted in certain ways. I'll tell you that maybe some things came easy, but most of it, I work just harder than everybody else. Right. I, like that's all I did when I when it bit me. That's all I did. Martial arts, even th you know, all through school. Like I, as soon as I finished school, I boom, right to the dojong, and and that's where I spent all my off hours. So you lived, ate, breathed taekwondo. Yeah, yeah. So I don't think I was that gifted. I think I just put in a lot more hours than everybody else. Right, and not everyone does it to compete. Correct. Correct. Yeah, some people just do it for the love of martial arts or the fitness or or the, the flexibility reasons and mental mind and body. Um, I don't think when I did it, I didn't have the intent of competition. And and, and Taekwondo wasn't in the Olympics when I started, obviously. Um, and uh, I, I was just doing it for self-defense purposes. And, and I just got hooked, you know, still today. I just love doing the martial arts. I, I probably do a little more jujitsu than anything else right now, but yeah, I'm still bit by the martial arts bug 40 plus years later. That's amazing. Cause some people just like get, they're over it. They're so tired of it, but you still obviously are living in it. Yeah. I, I think I, I, trained at such a high level where i mean we trained six 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 and a half hours every day uh, like at the olympic training center we first thing we woke up in the morning stretched and we did what a normal person's full day of workout would be in the, in the first couple hours of the morning then we go into the cafeteria eat breakfast we'd have a little massage time or downtime sports physiology and then we go into the next workout for two and a half hours. Then we ate lunch and had another little bit of downtime. And then we did another two and a half hour workout. Um, and, and then me, I would go do Taekwondo and teach Taekwondo classes right after that. And wow. so literally full days. That's quite, well, it's a full load for sure. Okay. And then let me just get back to when you went for the audition, did someone in the audi audience see you fight we're like oh that guy would be great in this role and then approach you to come audition is that how it happened uh for the commercial or film work oh actually for the commercial i'm sure the commercial went on yeah i, I they i think they kind of had an idea of what they wanted to do for that olympics and and that commercial was during the 88 olympics so it was going to be in korea so they thought well let's have some kicking in there and let's do the the martial arts for the kicking so they came to Olympic Training Center and they had some of the other sports there, but they took some of the athletes and auditioned all the athletes to see uh, um, who they wanted to cast. And uh, that was my first time in a casting process and I got it. <laughs> I mean, that's really rare to get a job your first audition. Yeah, they're like, hey, you might have a knack for this. And I was like, I don't know, it's fun though. You're a natural. Well, new print, I don't even know what that, I haven't even heard of it. So obviously your career has land, lasted longer than that new print yeah, I think that was that was the Advil of that time, right? <laughs> well, that says a lot.
you uh, outlast Nuprin. So, okay. And then what was the actual real mo movie? Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> what was your actual first movie job where you were doing stunt work as a stuntman, taking hits, falls? I did TV before features. So I, I think uh, I had actually one of my teammates that came out. He he had, we both, when we were competing, uh, signed contracts for a TV show that was called the WWMAC Masters. And uh, and he had Carrie, he was going to be Mr. Hollywood and and I was the Iceman. And, uh, but the, it never made it to season two. So those are the characters who are going to come in season two. So we're very excited about that. Uh, and then he had gone out and, became one of the ninjas in the show. So when we went, when he finished that, you know, he's the one that had talked me to come out to LA. He goes, look, if you, if you really want to do the film, you got to move to LA, you got to move to LA. And so I, I believed him and, and, and I ended up in LA and uh, started work right away. I, I was still, I had my own Taekwondo schools at that time. I was teaching and was coaching the U S team. And, um, I, I think I was doing a lot. I was I was coaching the U.S. team. I was like the executive director of the organization. I, I had started the national events of it and running a taekwondo school. And I had a taekwondo school in Hawaii, and uh, and then trying to do a film career at the same time. And wow. um, and he's like, you can't do all that. I was like, well, I don't want to be the starving actor. You know, everybody talks about you know the starving actor and. <laughs> And I think in my head at that time, I was thinking, well, I'm, I'm going to be more of the action star stuff. That, that's what I'm going to go for. And then I realized that, you know, what? I, don't, I don't think I'm a very good actor. <laughs> but this stunt stuff is really cool. This stuff I can do really well. And uh, so I started pursuing that. And, um, and I, the, one of the first TV shows I did was called Martial Law. And oh, I remember was, Sammo Hung. Sammo Hung, yeah. And so, you know, I, it, what a great experience. If you're going to go right into a TV show trying to do martial arts action, you know, that was the hot show on TV at the time. And I, I did one episode. Then next thing I knew, I was doing two, three, four, five. And I, 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 I must have done, you know, 15 episodes of martial law at that time. So, Oh, wow. I didn't yeah. know you had all those martial arts schools. Yeah. One in Los Angeles and one in uh, Hawaii. In, in Hong and I know you wrote some books. Can we pull yeah. up? One of his books. Oh no! There we go. Uh, oh yes. Those are, those are actually videos. Oh, are they videos? <laughs> yeah. There we go. Mastering the basics by Tim Connolly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's funny. Uh, I I had asked, hey, would you do a, a video series? And I was like, okay. I I come in and uh, I had a small window of time, and I said, uh, what I'll I'll do is a. Uh, let me do a, a, the basics, the competition, you know, so we'll lay, lay the groundwork and foundation for if you, if you're really interested in competition, these are the basics you should have in your foundation. So, so let me, let me, let me put a little piece together for you and we'll do that. And next thing I know, it, it was like this whole volume of series. I was like, how did you get like a six volume series out of one basic foundation exercise? So yeah, that, that's one I haven't seen in quite a while. Oh, I get, well, honestly, I guess you don't want to Google yourself. So <laughs> <laughs> that was a good find. You must have dug deep for that one. Oh, I would trust me. I dug very deep for information because you're a very private person and understandably so because you work on really high profile films. Like I said, Matrix, John Wick, like 300. It's crazy. Yeah, I've been very fortunate to be on some of the big iconic films, you know, as a as a stunt actor or a stunt double or or stunt performer. Yeah, I, you and you're know. super hum super humble about it too. Yeah, I, I think the first time I met you in in Vancouver, it was I was doubling one of the leads on a big action show. And what was it? What were you working on? I think it was Watchmen, right? It wasn't the Watchmen? Oh yes, who was in that? Oh boy, that was that was like big, it was a Mar Marvel yeah. thing. Uh, the, that was the graphic novel. Zack Snyder was directing, and uh, and it was off the graphic novel Watchmen, and uh, that that was that was pretty epic. I think I was doing that and Gamer at the same time in Vancouver. Yeah, yeah, I, I was doubling Jeffrey Dean Morgan. Okay. Yeah. And so we were shooting that in Vancouver and then I was shooting 
uh, gamer with Gerard Butler in uh, New Mexico. So I start, started there, flew to New Mexico, started that, then flew back to Vancouver to finish it, and then flew back to New Mexico to finish Gamer. That is crazy. It was, it was a busy 10 months. <laughs> Do you feel like, what era was your busiest time? I know you're always busy. I know you're always out of town, but like doing two movies at the same time, like that's not very like common, is it? No, not, not at that level. You know, I think that was a unique situation. And I, I probably started the business a little bit older than everybody else. Cause I was competing for so long and then I started coaching. So I didn't get in, you know, when I was in my, uh, early twenties, you know, I started, I think doing stunts when I was like 29, 30 ish. Um, so a little bit later, you know, but you know, most kids that come in now are like 21, 22 when they're getting their start or they come in through some extreme sport, uh, you know, at that early age, all the extreme sports are so young now. Right. And, uh, so a little bit, a little bit older. So I think at that time I was kind of in my prime where I felt like Superman, so I could do anything. Right. So right. you could burn the candle at both ends and do that. I couldn't do that now. <laughs> Let's talk about like the new generation stunt guys. Cause I feel like, you know, to a certain extent, you have to you have to pay your dues in terms of training and like honing the craft of stunt work. And then there's these kids out on YouTube and Instagram doing these like gymnastic type of stuff. Is it easier for them to get into stunts because of social media and that yeah. without the audition process? I think YouTube, YouTube has changed everything. You know, from, from uh, you know, I, I think every industry, especially the the film industry. So, I, like, uh, like we'll we'll search if you need a unique talent. Like, if we want, like, if I'm on my show and I need a unique talent, I, you know, we'll start with YouTube. What? Let's go find some, but somebody that's doing something different and interesting out there. And. Uh, you know, and, and and I think producers and, and, and studios are also looking at who's some of this new YouTube talent or social media talent that has some some charisma that we can put in our show and use their usership. You know, I, YouTube has changed everything in the industry. And like for me, when I was competing, you had videotapes like, you know, it was the small cams were still going. It wasn't, there was no YouTube at that time. Right. So you couldn't just jump on your computer and go, Oh, let's see who's competing and doing what everything was visa. So if you were lucky enough to get a VHS of somebody's tape um, and study it, like that was a big deal then. And uh, so I think the YouTube is the, the evolution of all sports has just jumped exponentially because of YouTube, because you can Google anything and learn it, break it down and, and, and try to evolve it where before, like you just had what was in your little bubble. Right. And, and if you got a videotape, you got to get outside that bubble or you travel. And, and that was the one thing that we did when we were competing a lot, we travel around the world to compete and see what everybody else is doing. But even that bubble's kind of limited to some extent, but YouTube has opened up everything so you know people watch movies and then somebody goes home and tries to duplicate it puts it on youtube and then they figured out some other way to do it and somebody up them and then somebody up them and and we're on there going hey look what that guy's doing let's see if we can use that in a movie let's give them a call and see what they can come do you know whether it's bmx bikes or you know motorcycles you know uh yeah so uh, yeah youtube has changed everything <laughs> And then the kids that come off from YouTube that get stunt work, do they, well, not even just them, but even young stunt kids these days, like, do they get an ego from it? Because I know, I don't know many stunt guys, but from what I've heard, a bunch of them have egos because it's like a macho industry. Yeah. I, well, I, I th that's the dilemma of YouTube, right? Like, um, some people would say like in, in my side of the world of it, like, some of the younger trickers that come up, like we came up in a very disciplined and senior junior martial arts regimen and, and uh, lots of respect. And I think some of the tricking, the way the direction the tricking went, if you watch some of that, they get and they kind of trash talk each other and, and do their tricks and up it. And it kind of like the break dancing realm, how that went. Right. But I think you lose some of that respect level and, 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 and hierarchy. And I think that just translates when you bring these young kids in, they haven't 
they haven't developed the same discipline and respect levels that some of the more traditional people did. And, and I think that's across all sports, right? Mm -hmm. the, you, you have less coach, less direct coaching and more learning it on your own again, because of YouTube, right? <laughs> yeah. And they probably lack the professionalism on set. They don't know the etiquette. And that's a big thing that I watch for. Like I typically won't hire somebody that hasn't proven themselves with a, some set etiquette or come with a high reputation. Like, like even if I found somebody on YouTube, I would bring them in, audition with them, work with them for a bit and see if it's somebody that I could actually bring on set, you know, because the last thing you want to do is bring somebody that's new and doesn't have set etiquette on and, and rub an actor the wrong way or, or hurt an actor or, or, or just, pissed the, the whole set off, right? Yeah. <laughs> so you, you, you don't you don't want to take that risk. So let's say there's some guy on the street or whatever. He's like, I want to be a stuntman, but I don't have any of these skills. I don't know how to ride BMX. I don't know how to skateboard. Like I could fight kind of like, is there something that they can do to get into the industry? Yeah, that's the hardest part. You can't do that on YouTube, right? If you're on YouTube, we're finding you. It's not you finding us. Yeah. And, and I, there's no easy way in. I think before, you know, maybe maybe 15 years ago, you could you could go on set. Before 9/11, you could actually just, if you were a stuntman or trying to be a stuntman, you could actually go on a set if you had a, a permission from a stunt coordinator or someone and just go visit the sets. Now you you just can't. That that's something you can't do anymore. Security levels are so high, you can't. There's so many crazy people out there too. And, and it used to be that what we call hustling, you could just bring your headshot out. Hey, I can do this. And, you know, here's my video. If you can watch my reel, you know, and see what I can do. Nowadays, I just, I just tell people like, find out where the really good guys are working out and training and get into the, get into a training session or let somebody see what you can really do. And, and uh, build the relationship there. And then if you get a little rapport and people can see you have a real skill set, that's that's a legitimate and easy way in versus cold calling somebody. Like like I said, I, like I wouldn't hire anybody off a cold call. Like, you know, I would have to get like four references to uh, to know that this person's actually safe, has some set etiquette, and it's not going to hurt anybody. Yeah, totally. You, you just can't tell who is going to send you their headshots or their resume. They, they could have a great resume, but still be crazy. Well, it, I, you know, it's funny because you'll get so many people go, I want to be a stunt guy. That's the best job ever. Like who wouldn't want to be a stunt guy? It's like, okay. And you get, you get people that just don't understand what it is, you know? And I, I remember one film I was on, uh, the directors, I think, had seen this person do something. Oh, well, they're going to bring him in. And, and they kind of pushed him on us. And we were like, okay, well, let's see what he can do. And he was a little bit cocky and, you know, you know, fairly puffing his chest, right? You know, this, that, that. And uh, we go, all right, well, let's see. We put him on what we call a dead man. And, and uh, so dead man's where you actually put a harness on and we tie a line to your back and you run to a, as fast as you can to a certain point and you hit a dead man you just go Pink, and boom it pulls you back so we put those like on motorcycles or if i was going to run into a glass wall but you can don't put the actual wall there or it's a limiter right so this is a legitimate wall and you can only go that far and then, then you'll get pulled back before that happens uh, so those are our dead mans and we go, okay, let, let's put this guy on a dead man and, you know, put him in that spot and, and see how he does. And he's like, oh yeah, no problem. We're going to do this. And boom, full speed, boom, knocked himself out. <laughs> and we were like, oh, <laughs> let's, get him up, let's get him up. Yeah. You, you tell him all the safety part of it. Right. So you prepare him for it. And, and but what people don't understand, it's, it's doing stunts is, it's not about doing one big wreck, right? It's about how can you do that wreck? Look at, make it look so painful, but don't hurt yourself and then get up and do it again 10 more times. And, and uh, that guy get, got up, didn't want to do it again and actually never came back to do stunts again. <laughs> oh, really? He's not so macho then. He's not a... <laughs> Well, it, it, like I said, it, it's it, like everybody, it looks cool, right? But it's not an easy job. Your body gets put, you're, you're basically a professional athlete. 
and and it's a skill set to you know if you want to fall fall off this 20 foot piece here chip down clip off this 10 foot piece and then go to the ground and boom and yeah, you know, there's a lot of athletic people out there that could do that one time, right? But we don't do it one time. We had to do that sometimes three, four, five, six times, you know, because something's wrong with the can uh, the camera, or this actor didn't do this, or this didn't happen. And uh, and then you got to do that ten times, and so you got to be able to do it and not hurt yourself ten times. That that's that's the tricky part. Yeah. Okay. So being a stunt double, we know that's super hard. You get rattled a lot. You get take lots of hits and bumps. What's the easiest part of a stunt double <laughs> or stunt person? Uh, like running away from a bus and not get hit? A double or a stunt person? So those, are, those are almost like two completely different jobs too. Okay. Let's just say an actual stunt person. So a stunt person, basically, we, 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 that's just somebody that's going to go out and, and we call those ND stunts or you're very specific and it's uh, nondescript stunts. So and, 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 and stunts, again, is like professional sports. Some people specialize in one or two things and they do it extremely, extremely well, but they don't go outside that box much. And then you get some guys that are just really good at everything. And uh, so being an ND stunt, you kind of want to be pretty good at everything. And that's a lot of work. You got to drive a car, you got to drive motorcycles, you got to be able to do a fight scene, you got to be able to do high falls, you got to be able to jump ratchets. And, and then it's like, well, where do you go learn all that? It's you can't just, you know, get in the yellow pages or, or Google, I want to learn air ramps. <laughs> I want to go do rat. You, you, there, there's nothing out there that is, is available. So um, it, it it's it's a lot of work. It's 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 a work ethic that's extremely difficult. So you again and go back to the professional athlete, right? You've got to put in the time. You've got to figure out how to learn this. And some people, you know, every money you earn, you're reinvesting it in learning a new skill set or putting it into some new equipment or how do I evolve this? And and it's you wake up in the morning, you're doing your workouts, you're going to go do jujitsu class, and then you're going to go ride motorcycles, and then you're building your drifting car, learning your car skills. It, you, you have to learn all area as a, and aspects of it. And, and you kind of have to be just okay, right? Uh, but a, a stunt double, you, you not only have to be good at everything because you have to find out to do all the hero things, but you have to have some serious... Uh, safety skills and personality skills because you've got to kind of cater and coach your your actor. So like if somebody, if I go in as a stunt double, I'll my job is not just to perform the stuff that he can get hurt or injured at, but I've got to coach him along the way and try to help him be able to do that as safely as possible. And in a lot of uh, casts sometimes, they're not comfortable doing the action and they'll tell you, well, I just want to do, I just use my double. But, you know, the real, you know, the, the real success is when you can get an actor to do something outside their comfort zone in a safe way. And if you can coach them to do that, you know, that that's big success for production and, and the performer. And that's a skill set all by itself besides even just performing. So you're more than just a stump double. You're like a coach, babysitter, motivator. <laughs> yes. Yes. And, and I've had jobs where, um, like uh, say with Gerard Butler, you know, even though when I uh, work with Gerard Butler on 300 and so on, it's like I I have to really look after him because that was outside his comfort zone doing the martial arts, working with the stabs and the spears and the shields. And and he's someone that's like, I, I want to do all my stunts. You know, I want to go out there and do it. And he's he's willing to put in the time and hours for it. But he doesn't want to do it if he's not going to look good doing it. Right. So now you're coaching and then how do you help build that confidence? So he feels like he's given his best performance and you know, if they're having a down day, how do you bring them up? And if they're not doing it good, how do you get them past the point of just saying, no, you just do it. You know, you still got to find that way to get them feel comfortable to give their best performance. So when they walk on set, they feel like I've got this. Um, and, and then you're training them, right? It's like, oh, well, how do I do this? Like on 300, you know, he was so specific. He worked out so hard. Like he could have went professional bodybuilding, I think, at that point. But 
like before every scene, he'd be like, okay, what do we see on camera? You know, say, so, okay, well, let's work on, the, you know, the dolls. Let's work on the oh, box. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we, we would work like I, he would do so many repetitions, you know, and I think he actually said, I've had, sh I have shoulder problems after 300 because of all the pumping up and, and, and lifting we did before every take and so on. And, that's yeah, so did you like train him? You train him for the stunt work, like the sword work and the any of the martial arts. Did you guys train in the gym together to get like a similar physique? So when the cameras were on you, it would emulate his body almost identically. Yeah, and you know, and it becomes fun. And he's like, like Draw Butler, so competitive, right? You know, it's like. Uh, and he'll come up and he's like, I think you're getting bigger than me. And I'd be like, oh, no, I think you got me past, you know, no, 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 you can maybe you slow down. I was like, no, 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 I'm trying to catch up to you right now. And and he he went from this to this. And by the end of the show, he was trying, like, I, I couldn't even hold water to him, like, uh, like how shredded he got by the end of the show, because he had a personal trainer. He had me training him all day on set. Right like there, if you guys are on the YouTube, is that you on the right, Tim? Uh, no, that's Gerard Butler on the right. And that's you on the left. No, no, that's another one of the cast members. Oh, there. forget it. <laughs> I thought one of them was you. Okay, I told you it's harder to get material on you, but yeah, he was like shredded. So do you guys oh. pump up before a scene, like to get the muscles jacked? Yeah, it, it was it was fun because you know I think. I think maybe some of the people thought maybe he was going a little, he, he's like, you, you know, my gun. Cause I have my little trailer of all the weights that I would wheel along set. Right. You know, so he could lift up and I, and he was the only one doing it. And I think maybe some of the other cast members thought maybe it was a little too much or whatever. Right. And, and uh, I said, look, you know, I think it's great. And, and I told him, I think I was like, don't, I wouldn't worry about what anybody else thinks. You're the one that's got to live with this performance and how you look. Right. And I was yeah, like, who cares? I, He's a star. I, told, I, told him I would do it. I, I, would I, too. I, would, I would do it. And I did. Right? Like I did my little scene. I played his father in the show. Right. So I played his yeah. father. When I Let's pull to that one up too. And, um, and, and so I did it. And we even had, uh, that's Zack Snyder's son, the director's son that played the, the young Leonidas, right? Right. And, uh, so we were doing it. We were doing the push-ups and pumping before the scene. And and by the end of the show, you had all the cast members in there pumping up before the scene. <laughs> yeah, because they didn't want to look like a flat. <laughs> a little trailer over here with the weights. We all want it. And, and we'd end up, finally ended up with a bench press on set. And uh, yeah, it's like everybody kind of fell into place thinking that's the way we need to do it. And I think it paid off. Every Everybody... All the entire cast worked so hard, and and uh, was I think everybody was pretty proud of their physiques by the end of that show. Yeah, were you guys all on a strict diet for three hundred? Yeah, on the first one, it was it was crazy. I mean, it, we had we show up with the entire cast, and we had our 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 meals down to each person had their own calorie count, right? So everybody had their own individual calorie count. Some people got four blocks of cheese and three almonds. Some people got six blocks of cheese and four almonds. And some people only got two blocks of cheese and a couple almonds. <laughs> I'm just appalled that there's actually, you guys actually ate cheese. <laughs> yeah. We had I'm cheese not appalled at the three almonds, but I'm appalled at the cheese. <laughs> Cheese and almonds was was like the main snack, you know, between the 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 meal. So we we I think we did we did three meals a day, two snacks, and um, and shakes. Shakes became a big deal. Like our calorie count was so low that when we're we're, we're on set and we're doing all these big battles, there there was almost mutiny one day because there was a mix up between who was going to bring the shakes out craft service or catering so there's a little confusion and and you you know how this is right you, you know when you're really leaning out that you know that your body knows when it's time for fuel right so imagine all these guys maybe we got 35 40 guys that are just working out all day long because in between scenes we would go do crossfit workouts oh my so god we, yeah, we do. If you weren't in the scene, you went straight to the gym to do CrossFit workouts or get a massage. So it was, it was either or. So you were constantly on set working or training. Or getting and, a massage. 
Oh yeah, there was a lot of cramping going on. And, okay, and, that's a perk and, from and, being and, and people, Yeah, and people are taking big wrecks, right? So you know, everybody, every, everybody's working hard. So, um, but one day that mix up, you had forty people on set going. The the internal clocks are going off like <sighs> shakes. It's shake time. There's like rumbling because they're in the stomach. Shake? <laughs> Where's the shakes? <laughs> We're not working till the shakes. Where's the shakes? It's like like the catering and and wouldn't even come to set. Like no, they're too angry. I'm not going to set. <laughs> Somebody make some shakes. Somebody just make something and bring it to set. This isn't Sparta without the shakes. We need shakes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was bad. The shakes were never late again after that. That's hilarious. I love it though. It's a great story. And look, you must have such amazing stories from the places, like obviously the movies you worked. And of course, you know, I'm a huge Keanu fan and you've been in two Matrix, I believe. Yeah, like you can't not be a Keanu fan, that, like uh, personally and professionally, right? He, I, like he's one of the most amazing people out there. And, and, and he just, yeah, you couldn't you know, ask for a, a better person to work with. There's a, there's a few of them out there. He is definitely one of them. And uh, yeah, just a, a sweet person inside and out. And same thing. That's the guy that comes in and puts in, in the, all the hard work. You know, I, there was one time we were, we were doing something on matrix. There was one move that, you know, he, and just to put this in perspective, he's broken. So even on the first matrix, he was broken. Like he had broke his back and his neck from motorcycle accidents. So everything hurts him. Right. And, and we, we train like professional athletes, like the group, our stunt team on the, on that matrix on matrix reloaded, like that, like that whole eight man team that was on there, everybody was high level martial artist, professional, high level professional athlete. And he came in and he motivated us. Like he would show up before us and do his little extra workout with his personal trainer. Then he'd do all the workouts with us. And then we'd wind down and do our little workout when everybody would leave and he'd still be doing his other workout. And, you know, so, and he's carried that through. Same thing with the John Wicks, all the John Wicks, he comes in and he'll put three months of, you know, three, three hour days in of just training martial arts and fight scenes every single day and beat himself down up until the show it's like no, nobody really works harder than that guy and uh one time he was uh, you're gonna say something no i'm just so like amazed such an inspiration for you guys too like your work ethic it's such a it's like he's a great boss to have because leaders lead by example and he's doing just that yeah, and, and he came to us and he was really having a frustrating day there was one move that he wasn't able to get and it irked him inside. It irked him. So finally, uh, the the brothers at the time came in, the directors, they came in and they said, okay, let's let's just get rid of this. And uh and and Wu Ping, the action director, came in and they said, let's just replace it with another move. And he was like, <sighs> he just felt like failure, right? And uh so he finally he goes, I think it's a cool move. And then he looked at all of us and go, do we do this move or do we do it? What's move? What moves cooler? And we all look like, well, the other one's good, but you know, this, this is definitely the cooler move. And, and he's like, you sure? And we're like, yeah. <laughs> and he's like, all right. And he, and he told the director, he's like, just give me, give me two weeks, hold this portion. Just give me two weeks. If I can't do this in two weeks, we ch change it. And he did every single day. He put probably an extra hour and a half, two hours into that one move amongst everything else we were doing, just trying to perfect that move. And he got it and it's in the movie. And But that's the mentality you're dealing with, right? If that's the right thing, somehow I will make myself do that. And, that's amazing. And, and what move was it? So I can go back and watch it and love him even more. Uh, I think it was one of the moves where a kick steps off somebody and spins in the air. I can't remember the exact move, but you know, it was, a, it was a tricky move and someone that's, you know, broken and not, you know, coming from a solid martial arts background, you know, that's difficult for anybody, even with a martial arts background. And he just said, F it. I'm going to, I'm going to do it. <laughs> and, he, 
yeah, his mindset just got him there and uh, he persevered and, and pulled it off and it's in the movie. He didn't settle for second best. He wanted what was supposed to be there. See, that's the thing that he's just, he's not a big interview guy, but that's something that he would never bring up. Like, oh, there's one move I couldn't get, but I tried really hard and I got, he's not, that's what we love about him. He's so humble. No, you, you won't find a more humble person and, and and more passionate about his work and how he feels about it. Like it, it, it could, could have just very easily went in there and go, Hey guys, I don't think I can get this. Let's find something else. You yeah. Know? That's the pansy that's, way out. And that's the typical way out too. But you know, I think we were really trying to set the bar high and he watches all of us, right? He's watching what we can do, you know? So we're inspiring him and in his mind. He's like, I can't let these guys down, right? I can't let everybody down. And if they think this is a cooler move, I'm going to, I'm going to figure this out. And at the same time on our side, we're like, man, he puts in all this. Like, we can't let him down, you know? So yeah. we're going to work harder. And, and it showed like the, the action in that show was ridiculous at, for that time. It's like you were exhausted by the time you walked out of the theater. Like what just happened? Like, it's insane. Yeah. It's like our hearts are racing with you guys. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, that, uh, that film, uh, Matrix Reloaded of, of everything in, in my entire career, Matrix Reloaded is still my favorite film that I've ever worked on because of the cast, you know, the, the cast were amazing, the way they trained with us every day, uh, the camaraderie of, of the cast in, in production, like every department gelled. Um, the, the training sessions, like we all sweat and bled together. And, uh, and, and it, it was really like a family out there. And it was just a bunch of athletic people trying to raise to the next level. And, and I think we accomplished it for that time. Like Matrix Reloaded was, it was cutting edge and, and uh, yeah. And then probably the next one is 300. That was another one where it's just a great bunch of people out there trying to do something different and great. And it just happens. The biggest movies are were the funnest ones that you've worked on. And well, they spend more money to get, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> like, like you figure Matrix, Matrix Reloaded. We spent, like, I don't know if it was six weeks or two months in Santa Monica hangar, just training and rehearsing with the cast before we even went up to San Francisco. And then we were up there for another six months. You know, we, we were probably doing another three months of training and prep and then shot for another three or four months. We, we spent a year together. Like most productions can't afford to spend that much in prep, but prep is where prep is where the success is you know that's the money that's well spent and 300 same thing 300 we 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 probably prepped for four months just on fight scenes and dieting and working out before we even got to camera that's i think that's a great gig to have just training fighting and for four months and then filming i think that's pretty sweet just in my eyes but for an athlete or a stunt person, it's it's a dream job because you get yeah. paid to do what you love, right? You know, I, I think, you know, there's a lot of people out there that might not want to work that hard, but, hey. <laughs> but, to, but to get the pay and do that, like the, those those were dream jobs for sure. And they paid off. They were very successful and, you know, high profile shows. So it's good. Yeah. So did a lot of the stunt people from the matrix go on to work on John wick? Because I know that, um, the owner of 87 11 worked on matrix and then he was one that, uh, created John wick. No. Yeah. So I think the the core fight team that was on matrix reloaded, I think that core fight team is kind of running everything now. Right. Like that core fight team is, was, it became 87 11 in a sense, like Chad Stahowski and David Leach, you know, they, they, and, and, and Damon Caro, Damon wasn't on the, the, the matrix, but the three of them, when they first started, that was from 300. Um, they, they left in the middle of 300, uh, probably midway through filming one weekend and go, right, we're going to go sign a lease on a, a space. We don't know what we're going to do with it. We don't know what it's going to become, but we have a place to go prep and previs and, and, you know, train. Right. And uh, we don't know how we're going to pay for it, but we're going to do something with it. And, but that became 8711 and that team from 
uh, Matrix are now, you know, the second second unit directors for action in all most of the major films, or you know, direct, all directing now, and that pretty much, you know, half the team from Matrix Reloaded was the the three hundred team too, the core three hundred team. Yeah. And we know when you guys are on John Wick, is it like a like like family where it's like, oh man, it's so good to see you. Like, come over for dinner. So, like, is it like family when you're reunited with your stunt brothers and like different actors? Yeah, I, for sure. In in you know because that was a a a one hundred percent eighty seven eleven project. You know, we, we were going in there. I don't know who those handsome gents are. They're very <laughs> handsome. <laughs> we got a Navy SEAL in there. We got an Australian superstar in there and one of the New York locals. Yeah, it was, it was yeah. a good bunch of guys. There. I approve. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the, that's, every person on that team is handpicked by the director. And that director is Chad Stahowski and David Leach from the, from the first one and the second, third one, you know, Chad Stahowski. But everybody is handpicked. And, and I'd say half the team is from 8711. Those are the guys that train there every day. And again, it goes back to what you're saying. Like, I wouldn't hire somebody that I didn't know that I knew could do the job. And that's part of that's part of the 8711 success is like most of the people that train there, they're on the same program, right? and you see what everybody can do each day, you know who can do what spot, and everybody's there, the mindset is everything. The mindset is the difference between success and, and, and no success. And the people at 8711, the, the, there's not failure. It's like, if I gotta spend 10 hours here trying to figure it out, then I'll spend 10 hours here trying to figure it out. And uh, and, and that's the success of these guys, you know, like Chad, I don't know that that guy ever sleeps. Well, I, exactly for John Wick. I mean, since Chad, I think he directed it, is it? Uh, Chad and Dave directed, co-directed the first one. And then Chad directed the next two. Yeah, And he's working on four and five right now. And I mean, I know he's like, has high standards, high caliber, and it's his movie. So I don't expect anything less than like the top percentile of, the stunt people on there no like chad's fanatical right the 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 bar with him is so high and uh it, it's hard to fail with chad because you know it again he doesn't sleep you know like when everybody else goes home and pours that glass of wine chad's there still trying to figure out how can i do this better right and it, it, it's like I'm I'm not there. Like I got to go home and have my glass of wine and decompress yeah. a little bit, right? <laughs> but I, like I said, I don't think Chad sleeps in that bar is high, and he demands that that on every film, and, and that's why he's successful. Yeah. So John Wick four and five. All right, can we see you in it? Do you come back from the dead from one, two, and three? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I came back from the dead each one, right? Uh, no, I will not be in four. Back dead from the dead actually from two of them already. So, cause I yeah. think I saw you in one scene and then I saw you in another. Yeah, I, I, I somehow was able to resurrect for two. Of them. <laughs> but yeah, will we see you in the future John Wicks with my future husband? Just kidding. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't think so. I don't know that my schedule is going to be a, allow me. I think they're going to get ready to go into production here pretty quick. They're, they're in prep right now. And I'm here in the UK for a significant amount of this year. So, oh, really? It's a long shoot. Yeah, I, I think you know this is. I, I'm here for at least six months. So, do you have like a little break in between where you come back to LA? Uh, no, I don't know that I'll get that break. I think once things get going here, we're in the pre pre prep right now. Then we'll move into the pre prep, and then uh, once that kicks in, we're in high gear. And I think the demand on the show is going to be moving pretty fast. I won't have time. Yeah. Life of a stuntman. Well, okay. Well, I usually conclude my show with uh, something a bit fun and light. Today we're going to do a fact or fiction with Tim Connolly. So I have some facts and fictions here, and I'm just going to read them out. And you tell me whether it is fact or fiction. How's that? Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I had to work really hard for this. 
It sounds scary. <laughs> it's actually really fun. <laughs> I'll, I'll let you down. <laughs> All right. So first things first, uh, it's been said that Keanu Reeves gifted a group of stuntmen, a Harley Davidson for their hard work on the matrix. Now you were one of the lucky stuntmen that were, that was gifted a Harley Davidson. True. Okay. So please tell us the story. What kind of Harley Davidson? How did it surprise you guys? I need the details here. <laughs> All right. So yeah, priceless story. And then this says so much about the kind of person he is, right? Um, we, we as a team, we were very, very tight. And he loves motorcycles. He's incredible. He actually owns a motorcycle company. Like a Archer. Real yeah. yeah, yeah um, amazing bikes. And um, we're we're on set, and and every every other weekend or so, we would rent Harleys just to get away and drive up the coast because we're in San Francisco. So we'd just drive up the coast for the weekend and then come back, and and we tell all the stories, and, and he'd be so oh that's so awesome. And we try to get him up, but his schedule would never allow for him to that's get out. Actually, a good him. impression of him, by the way. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> and uh, but he, you could just see how giddy he would get over that, right? And, and uh, and towards the end of the show, um, one day he just came out and he goes, "Hey guys, I just want to take a break." And he came out and just said, "I I just uh, I really appreciate what you guys have done." And it started to become like this uh, emotional moment of like like. And he pointed out each one of the team, right? He went to each guy, like you've done this and this, and I know you did this and this, and you did this and you did all those takes when I wasn't getting this and you never said one word. And, I, and when I was having trouble with this, you have, he went through each person and knew so much about what each of the team members was doing. Right. And very personal about it. And, uh, and he goes, so I just, I just want to show my appreciation. And then he, he kind of, he goes, can if you come back here and we go out on the back of the stage and there's this giant trailer back there and they're just, wheeling harleys off and all these identical harleys and we were like whoa this is great it was like he's finally going to go on a ride with us right so he rented <laughs> us a bunch of bikes and we're all going to go on a ride together this is awesome and he goes like and, and he turns like so i thought you guys probably need a couple more weekend rides. So what I did is I wrangled a few bikes for you and he had them customized for, you know, the matrix. And then some, we all had matching helmets with matrix on the back and our Amazing. team members. And, and it was like a tear jerk moment, literally. Like I think two of the guys actually shed tears and he's just like, I, like, I can't thank you guys enough for everything you put forward. And we are just like, what, you mean these aren't rentals? <laughs> no. So he had us signing all our certificates of ownership, and you know, all, and, and we're just like, you know, just you know, amazing. And then to have he goes, I couldn't get all the same colors, so I had to have a couple of them custom painted. But I wanted you guys to have them all matching, and and uh, it, yeah, it, it was just we were, we were dumbfounded, and of course we're on him immediately and we're right around set and we'd ride him back to the hotel. And he goes, I, so I, I've got it set up. You guys can ride it for a couple weeks, do your weekend ride. And then we're going to ship them back to LA for you. Oh you my know? God. So little did he know the trouble we were going to cause because our stages were the hangers on the Oakland airstrips up there. Right. So all the, the runways and everything. So we had all this space so you got eight stunt guys on their motorcycles, just whipping around the stages, like in between sets. All right, rehearsal's over. All right, right on the bikes. We had this open strip to just take the bikes at all different levels. And finally the, the directors come out. We go, guys, you know, this is so cool. But all we hear is we're starting to shoot. So they they shut us down for a little bit that's amazing and do you still have your bike i do not have it right no now. Yeah. no it's a sad story so. okay well that's a sad story we're not going to talk about because we don't talk about sadness here 
Yes. But that's pretty sick. You'll have to send me a picture of that bike one day just so I can look at it. Oh, plenty of plenty of photos. Plenty of photos. And we've got we've got all the team photos with the whole team on them out on the runway by the stages and yeah, that's uh that's one of those one once in a lifetime moments for sure. Literally. Once in a lifetime. That's so amazing. I get chills when you tell that story because it's you know, he's such a personable person like human being. And he takes the time to get to know you guys individually. And that doesn't happen. Like, no, that often. talk about it. Like he, like he literally does not want people to talk about that. Like, that's like, no, that was, that's, that's between me and them, you know? And, and it's like, like he's avoided that, you know, on, you know, talk shows. Like, like, like it's, it's so genuine that it's like, no, that was just between me and them. And that's yeah. the kind of person he is yeah we need more people like that in his world we, we definitely need more keanu reeves in hollywood for sure yeah if we could uh clone him that would be great <laughs> <laughs> all right next uh during the filming of 300 they would stop filming to feed you guys to stay on top of your diet for your rip physiques true there's the shakes <laughs> there's the shakes <laughs> you got to be on got to be shredded and not hangry. Like there was not enough days and hours to shoot that film. Like you're always behind schedule and we're shooting something so epic and the action scenes were massive. Um, like, you know, so much of that didn't make the film, right? We just, we were shooting so much and um, yeah, it, like to stop for 15 minutes just so guys can you got to think of the money that in time and, and you know the money and cost and time and that yeah, is especially for a huge production like that time is literally money to every two hours stop to feed 40 guys you know and that happened one day and it didn't happen again <laughs> that's insane so that's yeah. why between takes between shots is then when you guys are fed your snacks yeah it it yeah, that was our that was our snack time or meal time. It's like every two hours we ate something, and we were so calorie deficient in that that it was it was needed. Like it, you didn't need a clock. Like everybody just when two when two hours came around, you just see everybody start going. <laughs> yes, they're, they're looking as the food close. <laughs> I know the feeling because back then when I competed, once it's like two two and a half hours, I was just like, okay, I need to eat. I know. Yeah, your your body just starts yelling at you. Yeah, it's yeah, so. it's not a fun place to be, to be honest with you. <laughs> no, and you know, and I I think for fitness, probably what you did, you know, you get your you get your windows right, so you get your small windows. That was six months straight. <laughs> oh God, you literally, you guys should have just entered a bodybuilding competition. Uh, there was a few guys that could have easily did that by the end of the show, like like. We had, a, you know, because they put a little bit of highlight uh, shadowing, right? I was going to ask if they contoured the abs. Yeah, so everybody got that because they're the the reason for it is they were because they're crunching the colors, the blacks, and everything. So without that, you don't have that crunching effect. So the same thing was on the cheekbones and around the eyes. It wasn't just the abs; it was you know every part of your body because that was the effect of that graphic novel cartoon look right so it wasn't so much as an aesthetic as it was for the stylistic point and um there's some guys that were so shredded like every striation in there when they put some of that shading it hit it actually they look less shredded because of the, of the uh, highlighting and uh and, it, and i think there's there was a couple times like Gerard Butler worked so hard, right? <laughs> he were, he put in the work and the diet. And, and, and for him, it's funny. Here's a funny story about him. Um, and and I, I think he's fine if I tell this, that, you know, he's a guy that enjoys life, right? He He's like, he's not afraid to put in the work to do whatever it takes to do the job, but he enjoys life, like food, like to have a good meal or have this, like for him to cut that out, is huge like because he wants to enjoy life and he loves a good meal right and so he did the hard work he did the hard work and uh i think you know there was a couple people go oh so they just cg'd your abs on or something <laughs> they're real they're, and he would you could tell the anger is like no that was real <laughs> like because you you know it's 
you when everybody you put you know how to, if you put that hard work in to get you know how hard it is to have abs right that doesn't come easy unless you're genetically gifted right and and to have somebody come up to you go oh those were cg'd on is like the highest insult uh, very <laughs> insulting those were earned i earned every bit of that in that voice <laughs> all right oh, next one you. uh okay at your wedding your intoxicated cousin Chad started showing off his mediocre martial arts skills and belligerently challenged your guests to fight and had to be kicked out. False. <laughs> yeah, that's that's fiction. <laughs> nice <laughs> try. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know much it was Chad. There was, split, there was a splits competition, probably. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> like the John called Van Damme split? Yeah, the Chad Sahowski splits competition. <laughs> I don't know why I chose Chad because I think Chad's like the equivalent of a Karen. So it wasn't because of Chad's uh, your friend Chad. <laughs> no, no, actually, I think it was at his wedding. It was there was a splits competition. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. Next, because mar martial arts is traditionally not taught to foreigners or white people, you're challenged by a Taekwondo ninth degree black belt in Korea for a fight. Ooh, yeah, probably false. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, did you actually have to think about that one? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I had, to, you know what, you're such a hard person to find info from, so I had to use my creative abilities. And actually, it's, that one's from Bruce Lee's background, I think, because he was challenged because he's teaching non-Asian people. Okay, last one. I did, though, get a chance to be the first non-Asian person to coach a martial arts team in China. Oh, wow. Yeah. So we went to Beijing to coach the Chinese Taekwondo team, national team to get ready for the world championships. And, uh, and, and it became kind of a big deal because they're like, there's a, there's a white guy teaching Asian martial arts to the Chinese national team. <laughs> yeah. That's really odd. <laughs> uh, so that was an interesting experience. Yeah. Did you use a translator? Yes, we definitely had a translator. That's so yeah, fascinating. Myself and Dae Sung Lee, we went over there and they got, they ended up, one of the females won a gold medal at that world championships. Oh, wow. Yeah. From a white dude through a translator. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. I helped a little bit. <laughs> the assist. All right, last one. You've broken a lot of bones, torn ligaments throughout your years of stunt work. But uh, one time, Ice Cube the rapper broke your nose. <laughs> no, I, I, I think it was a uh, triple X, you know, on triple X, I, uh, on triple X, the second one, number two. And, and, uh, we were doing a fight scene and, um, uh, I think, uh, there's sometimes cast members can get a little excited and do it. And he's a go-getter, right? He want, he's, he's going for it. And, uh, and that was one of the fights. There wasn't a lot of rehearsal time in there and he just kind of added a extra blow in there. And, and, uh, we, I caught one in the nose and I could tell my nose is just getting ready room and blood just room. So we wiped the blood and I'm just like, I told him, I go, we got to go again right away before my nose gets unrecognizable. And, uh, just get it. And then, then, cause they were like, Oh, we're going to stop I go, No, no, no. Just keep going. We will get this. Cause if, once my nose goes, like you're not going to be able to hide that. And That's so crazy. We, we so he just away. put in an extra punch that was not in the script. Yeah. And it happens when the adrenaline gets going, you just kind of get a, you know, an extra move or find its way in there sometimes. And, uh, yeah. So, well, you're but, a very kind person to. Uh, girls are the that. kind of stories you try not to talk too much about, right? Copy that. <laughs> All right. Well, that's it, folks. Um, you can find Tim on Instagram. You could find him in the next movie of his. Sorry, you have to remind me of the name. The Watchtower. Gangs of London. Uh, why did I say Watchtower? <laughs> I was thinking The Watchmen and something else. Okay. And when that's a long filming, is it going to be released next year? Because it's not going to be wrapped until like end of fall. Yeah, more than likely that's a 2022 
show. I, I, you know, it's, it's possible, but with all the COVID stuff, it just slows everything down. So yeah. trying, trying to do productions with all these new COVID policies, it, it's tough. So I, I don't know what their intended release date is right now, but there's a good chance. It's kind of the beginning of, of 2022 probably, or okay. end of 2021. Well, until then, you everyone can go go watch uh, the John Wicks, the Matrix, Three Hundred, and uh, Alter Carbon because you were Joel. Alter Carbon, yes, yeah, I was yeah, a fan I of his. Double Joel Kinnaman, and I and I did the fight choreography for a good part of it, and uh, and uh, yeah, I and that's a, I I I I'm a fan of Alter Carbon. I, I especially the first thing. I thought the first season was very interesting. Yeah, I watched the first season. I didn't watch the second one because he wasn't in it. <laughs> Joel, Joel's another one of the good ones. Oh, well, it looks that way. One of the good ones. He's well, so are you, Tim. And I thank you so much for being on. And hopefully, you'll be back and we all can get together with no COVID, hopefully. Yes, we look forward to that day, hopefully, sooner than later. Yes. All right. Well, be safe, Tim. Take care. Thanks. Thank you. Good to see you. Likewise. Jason, you could cut.